All right. It looks like we are live. So hello and thank you to everyone for joining today's session. Um, my name is Kristen Allen and I'm an associate director on the science team here at SHL. For those of you who may not be familiar with SHL, we are a global leader in HR technology and psychometric science. And one of the reasons that I'm really proud to be part of SHL is that we are passionate about supporting our customers in their journeys to disability inclusion and creating inclusive and accessible assessments. So I'm really excited to be here with you today to talk about our neurodiversity research program and some tips for disability inclusion in organizations. I'm joined today by Claire Mottram and Luke Camden, who are scientists on our research team at SHL, and our very special guest, Charlene Overend from Purple Tuesday. We'll do some introductions in just a moment, but first I wanna give you a quick overview of what you can expect in that today's session. First, we are here to celebrate Purple Tuesday. Um, Purple Tuesday is a global social movement aimed at improving the customer experience for disabled people and their families. So Charlene will tell us more about Purple and Purple Tuesday in just a few minutes. We'll also share an update on the progress that we've made at SHL with our neurodiversity research program. And then we'll discuss some actionable ideas for advancing disability inclusion in organizations. We do have some fun interactive features planned um, for our session today. So please do get involved. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback and engage with you throughout the session. You can also share your questions in the chat as we go and we'll do our best to answer them either during the session or if we don't have time, we'll follow up with them afterwards. So next, let's introduce our guests. Claire, would you like to kick off our introductions? Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name's Claire Mottram and I'm a senior scientist at SHL. Uh, I've been with SHL for nearly 13 years now. Uh, started out in the consulting side before moving into science. Uh, I head up our neurodiversity research program. I uh, was inspired to do so for a couple of reasons. So one was the lived experience of having a neurodivergent child at home and watching some of the barriers that she's faced over the time, as well as our friends and our family members, um, and wanting to be part of the movement to improve things and remove those barriers. And the other, I guess, from the consulting experience, so having had that question from numerous clients about how can we best support our neurodivergent candidates and never quite having the evidence-based answers to be able to give those sources of inspiration. So, yeah, really excited to head up the research team. Uh, so proud of how passionate everybody is in trying to work out what helps, what hinders, how we can make changes to our products and our platform to make things more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Claire. Luke, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background next? Yeah. So my name is Luke Camden. Um, I'm an associate scientist with SHL. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, so not as experienced here as Claire and Kristen. Um, but I joined uh, SHL about a year and a half ago and right away uh, jumped right into the neurodiversity research program, um, which is something that I'm passionate about uh, because I have dyslexia and dysgraphia. Um, it was something that I was diagnosed with as a kid. Um, and that's always been sort of a part of uh, who I am that I kind of like struggled with, wanted to hide, didn't really want that to be known of like who I am as a person. But then as I came to SHL and saw the amazing work uh, that they were doing with the research program here, I felt like that was sort of a part of me that I could kind of like take control of, be a part of the research and kind of make other people's experiences better based on sort of what I've seen in the past and really just kind of wanted to join them make a difference there. We're so glad to have you, Luke, on our research team. Charlene, over to you next. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm Charlene Overend, and I uh, head up Purple Tuesday. So I, I lead the, the global movement that is working to improve the experiences of uh, disabled people, people with disabilities, uh, from that uh, customer experience point of view, uh, first and foremost. And I also uh, lead the team of um, uh, partnership managers who then have um, who work with those organizations to take them through their own uh, journey to better disability inclusion and and, and that's neuro inclusion um, as well as part of that so I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you here today uh, in recognition of Purple Tuesday and and the fantastic work that you have done. Well thanks Arlene we're so glad to have you too. Um, it's hard to believe that it's been a whole year since we were together in Minneapolis last year when we hosted the inaugural celebration of Purple Tuesday in the U.S. at the SHL offices. Um, that was so much fun. And I can't wait to hear, how did this year's events go? 
Um, I would probably say even bigger and better uh, if, I, if, I, if I could. Um, yeah, we um, celebrated in uh, seven countries this year, uh, including in the UK from London and Edinburgh. Then we were in Berlin, Dubai, Karachi, Kuala Lumpur, New York, Hong Kong. So uh, absolutely, it's uh, um, what we call a movement moving. And um, yeah, with over 6,500 organizations across those countries have participated, making over 7,000 changes to accessibility. So, you know, a really significant impact um, from the events this year. Wow, it's so inspiring to see how it's grown um, and all of the impact that you're making globally. It's really exciting. Um, yes. And Claire, you were able to take part in the London events this year. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I was indeed. So first of all, a massive thank you to you, Charlene, and to your team. I know I've seen kind of firsthand how much effort goes into all of this. Um, so thank you for giving up your downtime today um, to join us for yet another event. Um, yeah, the event was amazing. Um, I had the pleasure of joining last year as well. Um, another fabulous venue. The views were absolutely breathtaking. It was all decorated in purple, as you'd expect, as well as the people. Um, and I think, you know, one of the key things for me was watching the partners panel um, when we had all these partners sharing their inclusion journeys, small things, big things. And I think there was just so much to take away that everyone could find something that they could apply and get inspiration from. Um, and I was talking to the lady next to me at the event and we were saying, you know, all of these pledges that people make year on year, each one making such a big difference, like, the movement is just so inspiring um, and genuinely does make a difference. So thank you all for everything that you do. Um, and I think the, the final thing I want to say was that message that keeps coming through from all the sessions I've been to, which is to not kind of be afraid of having to reach for perfection. And everything is about starting your journey and making that next step. And yeah, just so pleased to have you guys there helping us to do that and uh, helping us along the way. Yeah, no, absolutely, Claire. It's 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 about making those small, consistent changes year on year, and the cumulative effect is is huge. And you know, if you've got six thousand five hundred uh, organisations making all these small, you know, changes, then that is you know quite significant in terms of that cumulative effect uh, globally. Um, and we want more. <laughs> we need more. Uh, uh, there's more countries to be able to to uh, engage with. So. You know, thank you to SHL for your continued support. Well, you know, Purple is really near and dear to our hearts here at SHL. We have a long history of um, being partners, um, and we're really proud of that. In fact, a couple of years ago, back on Purple Tuesday in 2019, SHL made a Purple Pledge, and that was our commitment um, to improve the assessment experience for candidates with hidden disabilities. And so out of that pledge, um, our neurodiversity research program was born. So um, that was really impactful um, and something that really has made a difference for us and for our clients and their candidates globally. Um, I was a founding member of the neurodiversity research program back in 2019. And so it has grown quite a bit since then. And that's something that I'm really proud of. Um, I now lead a team of scientists with Claire and Luke and a number of others who are working on advancing this important research. And we certainly don't have all the answers yet. Um, we've been working hard at this for four years, but we've made a lot of progress in terms of defining evidence-based best practices for our clients in fairly assessing neurodivergent candidates. So I can't wait to talk more about that today. But first, let's talk more about disability and disability inclusion. So in just a moment, you should see a QR code on your screen. Um, if you want to scan that QR code, you will be taken to um, an interactive feature through menti.com where you can participate in um, the interactive features we've got planned for today's session. The first one is going to be a word cloud. So the word cloud um, will ask you a question about what does disability inclusion mean to you? So um, you see the questions there. If you can scan that code, you can let us know what does disability inclusion mean to you? And while we're waiting for um, those responses to come in, Charlene, do you want to tell us a little bit about Purple's perspective on what does disability mean and what is what is disability inclusion and what is the importance of that? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, from our perspective, and I suppose globally, it's it's defined in 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 uh, this way. It's you know, it's it's any condition that uh, affects the body or the mind um, that makes 
it's more difficult for that person to do certain things, daily activities, such as getting dressed. Um, you know, disability is something that is, is substantial and it's long term uh, and it has that negative effect on undertaking normal daily daily activities. Um, it's not it's not short term. Sometimes we might experience short term disabling um, um, effects, such as when if you broke a leg, for example. Um, but that would not be defined as um, having a disability. Um, and in terms of um, disability inclusion, it's for um, individuals just as much as it is for organizations to be able to see the person and the ability and not the disability from, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I know some of the research shows, you know, disability is sometimes only a disability due to the lack of fit between a person and their environment. So it's those environmental barriers that kind of make that disability for the person. Um, and so it's really important to think about how we can make those environments as inclusive as possible to kind of reduce the impact of, of disability. Absolutely. It's a social construct, right? You know what I mean? It's um, it's 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 where the environment completely disables the individual and not and not uh, the other way around. And we've moved forward now, you know, from this medical model where the person has to be fixed to be able to in the in the uh, in society around them rather than actually society and the environment being um, um, amended or adapted or you know to to to, to suit the, the the environment or the individual uh, the social model of disability yeah yeah it's a, that's an important perspective it looks like we've got a lot of um, great responses coming in about what does disability inclusion mean to you so things like fairness equality accessibility equity people first, um, belonging, and opportunities for all. Um, any reflections or comments on um, what disability inclusion means to each of you? For me, I, I like the word equity. It is, you know, that, that's probably where we need to get to uh, an equitable experience for everyone. If, you, if, if things are made that are accessible and inclusive, then, you know, rather than, um, because equality is one thing, but what is equal for you and a condition for you might be very different for me. So it's about actually having that person first and, and per, per, person centric approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, giving each person what they need kind of at the right time to create that level playing field. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's yeah, a really nice of, graphic. Sorry, go on. I was gonna say, yeah, I think kind of going off that is what really like stands out to me and thinking about everybody as sort of an individual and what we can do to help the people succeed um, and not just kind of disabling them based on the environment or whatever's going, uh, whatever mm -hmm. kind of might stand in their way. So that kind of stood out to me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that opportunities for all, um, I know obviously some of the content that we're gonna cover today and you know, around things like employment, um, and things like that. And I just think it's so important that they have that opportunity. And that is such a big part of accessibility and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. <clears throat> All right, well, let's do some myth busting next. So we've got enough, a couple of other um, quiz questions that we're gonna access through the, the same QR code in Menti. Um, so let's see if we can get that next, the first question here up on the screen. I'll go ahead and give you a little preview here while we're waiting um, for technology to catch up. So um, the first question that we want you to answer in your interactive quiz is what percentage of the global population lives with a disability? Um, so that should be a multiple choice question. Um, if you can see it in your survey, um, I think the responses are 7%, 17% and 27%. So let us know what percentage of the global population you believe lives with a disability. We'll give a couple of minutes or a couple seconds, I should say, for those responses to come um, rolling in. While we're waiting for that, Charlene, do you have any um, background information on prevalence of disabilities that won't spoil the answer to our question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, put me on the spot. Um, yeah, well, I don't want to give it away. This is the thing. 
Right. And, I'm trying to remember, and I'm trying to remember what uh, the uh, the other questions are so that I don't give any of those away either. Um, yeah. I think there, you know, it's it's really important to think about both visible and hidden or invisible disabilities mm -hmm. when you're looking at 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 this uh, figure. Um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, hidden disabilities. 80% of the disability population are living with a hidden impairment. So, you know, it's it's quite a, a significant um, part of that group of uh, the disability community. So, and obviously neurodivergent uh, individuals are within that population as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's a really good um, distinction to make. And I think we are, we have closed the polling question, I think. We're just not seeing it up on screen yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and start to, to, to talk a little bit about the answer. So 17% um, of the global population lives with a disability. So it's more than than many people might realize. Um, that number is higher than you know I originally realized. And um, I think it's really important that we think about that is a, a large percentage of the global organ of the global population that's living with some sort of disability and the impact that that has. Um, our next question is a true or false, and the next mm -hmm. question is: Most disabled people were born with a disability. So let us know if you think that is true or false. Don't we just love technology? <laughs> We're not sure if our attendees are answering this question or not. I think I think you have access to it and we just can't see it on screen. Here we go. Okay, amazing. Um, so most people were born with a disability. It looks like the majority of our attendees believe that that is false and you are correct. So 83% of disabilities are acquired between the ages of 18 and 64. Only 17% of people um, that have a disability were born with that disability. So very few people um, are actually born with a disability and most become disabled during their lifetime. So I think it's, it's really interesting to think about that. Um, one more polling question for you. We'll see if we can get the technology right this time. Um, what do you think is the employment gap for people with disabilities in the UK? So this one is specific to the UK, not the global population. It's really hard to get a, an accurate global estimate. So we're going to go a little more specific. What do you think is the employment gap for people with disabilities in the UK? So your options are 10%. 20% or 30%. So let us know what you think. Yeah, and by employment gap, I guess we mean the difference between the employment rate for those who've um, got a disability and those who haven't. So that's what the gap is. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like the majority of our attendees um, voted for 20%. Um, still many people got the right answer though at 30%. So the, the estimated employment gap is 30% in the United Kingdom. That means that 82% of the non-disabled population are employed, but only 52% of the disabled population are employed. So huge gap there. Um, and just something that really brings to light how important it is for us to be sure that we're breaking down barriers to employment for the disabled community. Um, so not only thinking about organizations and how they can be more inclusive, but starting even sooner. How can how can organizations be more inclusive with their hiring process to ensure that disabled community, um, people in the disabled community are getting those right opportunities for employment? So, Charlene, do you have anything else to add about disability employment rates? Yeah, um, well, that 30 percent figure has, has sort of been in the UK for the, for the last 15, 20 years. We're not seeing much movement. It, it slightly goes down, slightly goes back up again, but it's it's hovering in around that 30 percent. And, you know, um, we, there's research out there that shows that like 45 percent of those in hiring 
roles are still not confident about hiring disabled talent. And, and so there is this, you know, barrier that exists within hiring that is preventing more opportunities being provided to um, to people with disabilities to to gain employment. So so I think we do have to address um, address that and, and some of the work that you're doing is going to absolutely you know a, a, a help that um, and we know that 23% of the working age adults in the UK are living with a disability. So it's 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 a really like one in four people in the workplace um, has a disability, and so from an organisational point of view, um, a does does your uh, disclosure figures represent that? Um, are people still choosing not to disclose whenever the data, you know, wider data shows that uh, th these are the these are the numbers? Um, and so from an organizational perspective, what can we do to encourage more people to be open and, and to be um, um, honest about their own conditions and uh, because they need to feel supported to be able to thrive in the workplace? Um, and um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, there's lots of different statistics around, you know, disability and, and employment that, that needs to be addressed. I think the disclosure piece is so interesting and it's something that we put on our research agenda for this year to try to help us better understand not only how can we research, but how can we provide best practice recommendations for organizations. Um, if, if their candidates and if their employees aren't disclosing, then there's it's more difficult to support them, um, which is why we advocate for this kind of more inclusive approach to kind of be inclusive even if you don't know who around you, because certainly someone does. Um, have some of those disabilities. And Claire, you did some research on this too for our recent white paper. Um, what did you find about those kind of stereotypes in the hiring process? Yeah, absolutely. So very similar story in terms of lower employment rates, um, even lower for some types of neurodivergent conditions than for some of the disability conditions. Um, and even more so when you think about underemployment, so people who are in roles that don't kind of use their skills and potential to the maximum. Um, and like you say, we did some reading around just to try and understand the neurodiversity landscape. And some of the research pieces were quite startling. So there was a survey by the Institute of Leadership and Management where 50 percent of leaders said that they wouldn't be willing to hire somebody who was neurodivergent. Um, and that was due to kind of stereotypes, um, false um, bias, things like expecting to have to do a lot more management time with them. Um, there was another su uh, study done where they submitted fake job applications and there was a gap in employment in this in this one application. It was identical apart from the reason why. So on one, it was a mental illness and one, it was a physical illness. And they found that there was a lot of stigma about the mental illness and that they didn't get put forward in the recruitment process as much as the others. Um, so I think it just goes to show that it's really not surprising that people choose not to disclose all the time. Obviously, we want to do as much as we can to encourage that to create the safe environments. But ultimately, we also need to try and remove that burden um, of disclosure by trying to make things as accessible and as inclusive as possible in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important to shift that mindset. <clears throat> totally agree with that. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm really proud of um, at SHL is our commitment to inclusive assessment. And so as I mentioned, this was really kicked off in 2019 um, with our neurodiversity research program. But we have this year broadened our focus to a more inclusive assessment research program. So we are now looking at um, some targeted studies around other types of disabilities, too. So, Charlene, what is the, your perspective on the significance or the importance of this type of research? Or how do you see it making an impact? Well, <laughs> Any insights regard, you know, is going to be important um, because I think, as to Claire's point, we need to shift that, uh, you know, the biases and the stereotypes, and through evidence of being able to demonstrate, you know, the the the, the capabilities um, and the barriers that exist for those different um, um, types of disabilities for the in the decision making uh, roles is just going to be hugely important because it's going to open up more job opportunities. It's going to create more opportunities. It's going to also, I think, bust more myths around what um, is uh, perceived about disability in general uh, and and what people can bring to the to their their organisations. Like we, you know. We absolutely advocate education um, as a way of being able to to drive this agenda forward. And 
you know, we have to be able to um, inspire the, the people that are making these decisions who are leading those organizations so that they can see the actual contribution and the value, both social and commercial, that these uh, that disability brings to their business. And, and that's that's what we are doing um, um, from, from an organization's perspective, trying to change the narrative around disability and disability inclusion. And pieces of research like what you guys are undertaking is, is feeding into that business case the, the, um, which is needed to be able to transform um, uh, the experiences um, and also to build the confidence of those that are making the decisions so that they can then, you know, um, implement the, the, the things that need to be done to become more inclusive. Yeah, and I think it's so important. We we learned that early on that there's a, a big gap in the research between science and practice. And when our clients were asking us, how can we be more inclusive or neuroinclusive for our neurodivergent candidates, there really wasn't much out there in terms of um, best practices. So that's kind of why we felt the responsibility to start with this research and help to drive that um, agenda that can inform best practices for organizations to be more inclusive. So speaking of education, um, Luke, let's talk more about neurodiversity and what is neurodiversity. This is a hot topic in organizations. It's a buzzword that we're hearing all the time. Tell us more about what neurodiversity means. Yeah, so to give a sort of technical definition, I guess, of neurodiversity, um, neurodiversity is an all-encompassing term um, that includes all of the natural variations in how people think, interact with, and perceive the world around them. So really it's sort of an all-inclusive term that brings together all of the different ways people's uh, cognitive uh, functioning could include, um, whether that be like OCD, um, uh, autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, all those are kind of included together into one um, definition there. It is important to recognize though, kind of as you mentioned, Kristen, uh, this is a very like hot topic, hot button um, term right now. So the language is evolving really quickly. Um, an example of that is just in the fact that even though that definition I just gave of neurodiversity has been pretty consistently used for a while now, there's still a bit of debate around whether or not um, sort of emotionally based mental health uh, conditions would be included in that, things like depression um, or generalized anxiety disorder. Um, for us, we do include that because we like to have sort of one all-inclusive term, uh, but as you read uh, other articles around the place, you might not see that included in there. But as far as what neurodiversity actually means to me, I think the importance of it is as a sort of way of recognizing that there are so many different ways that people process and work through information, so many different ways that people sort of like cognitive processing actually works. And neurodiversity is all about recognizing those differences and really showing that difference does not mean worse. Um, that just because there's a different way that people might read or understand process information doesn't mean that they're worse at it. Instead, it's sort of a focus on maybe shaving down the edges of society so that those different functioning processes work just as well as what might be considered like a typical way of processing information. Yeah, so another point towards the argument of the importance of the inclusive environment um, that can allow everyone to thrive, regardless of their individual differences and the way that they're thinking and processing information. One thing I just want to add to that, too, is you'll hear we tend to use the word neurodivergent um, to refer to someone who is not neurotypical. Um, but there's also another number of other terms that are used. So things like neurominority, neuroatypical. And so the language is evolving. Um, and you, you may hear some of these different terms um, being used in addition to neurodiversity and neurodivergent. Charlene, tell us about um, what does neurodiversity mean to purple? I think it's it's pretty similar to what uh, Luke says. You know, we we all um, have unique ways. <laughs> Our brains all work differently, um, and um, you know, we all have a different way of thinking and, and absorbing information. Um, and you know, the neurodiversity, neurodivergent is 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 people that their brains work slightly different to the neurotypical person. Um, and so completely agree with uh, Luke's uh, definition um, um, on neurodiversity. And, you know, we mentioned this is really becoming a hot topic in organizations. We certainly are seeing this um, with the organizations that we work with. I know, Charlene, you mentioned you're seeing it too. 
what do you think is driving the rising interest in neurodiversity? And in what ways are you seeing organizations becoming more interested and wanting to do more? Um, I think because we've, we've seen um, some organizations who were early adopters um, to, to it um, and have created neurodiversity programs um, where they have directly um, with effort went out to engage that community to employ um, because they could see the, the additional skills and attributes and qualities that the neurodivergent talent can bring to an organization to embrace them and bring them into the business and then being able to evidence the return on that investment. Um, I think that has um, definitely encouraged others to open up their eyes to the opportunity to be in more neuro uh, inclusive. Um, and I'm seeing um, many organizations uh, approaching this in, in different ways. Um, some of them are um, sort of doing a, I call it more like a diagnostic of where they currently are on their journey, journey to being neuro inclusive, understanding where the barriers exist um, within their organization from policy and process through that candidate experience from end to end, um, the onboarding uh, process, right through to whenever they, they, they have attracted that talent into the business to then supporting them, um, whether that's through like a workplace needs assessment to ensure that they have everything that that, that individual has to be able to thrive in the workplace, um, back down to ensuring that there is uh, a level of awareness and the fact onto that education program, uh, awareness right across the business for uh, colleagues to see the value that neurodivergence mm -hmm. brings to the to the to the organization and giving them the skills and the and the confidence to be able to yeah. support colleagues with uh you know neurodivergent conditions in in the business and this is extremely important at a line manager level so that they are able to uh, provide that additional support for that individual to be able to bring their best selves to to the uh to the workplace um but yes i am definitely seeing a, a rise in organizations wanting to become more neuro inclusive yeah, it's such an important point. You know, the research that we do is focused on assessment and making those hiring decisions. But once you bring a neurodivergent person into your organization, there's so many things that need to be in place to provide the right supports to make that successful and creating that inclusive environment. Um, I know on the hiring side, we're seeing a number of organizations that are more interested in neuro inclusion lately. Um, some are working with um, neurodivergent or neurodiversity specific recruitment agencies and specifically trying to recruit from this talent pool. We see others that have launched autism at work programs, um, really just trying to embed that aspect of neuro inclusion into their organizations deliberately. Others want to be neuro inclusive, but they're not sure how to do it. Um, and so that's where we're kind of coming in and trying to define what are some of those best practices for organizations. The research is clear, though. Um, organizations benefit from greater productivity, more innovation, um, better employee morale and employee engagement when you've got blended teams of neurodivergent and neurotypical people. So, um, you know, I think the benefits are clear. It's just a matter of how can we ensure that organizations have the right tools to be neuroinclusive and um, adequately support um, a diverse workforce. So let's talk more now about SHL's Neurodiversity Research Program. Um, so Luke, tell us more about um, your experience with the research program um, and what the team has been up to over the last four years. Yeah, love to, Kristen. Um, so over the last four years, uh, we've really been focused on understanding the complete experience of neurodivergent candidates, uh, which is more than just understanding how they perform on our assessments, but really talking to them directly and understanding reactions um, and just overall challenges that they might face on our assessments. And a huge part of that has been going out and actually partnering with external organizations so that we can reach more wider groups of populations and talk to more people who have experience with these sort of, or these lived experiences with these uh, different neurodivergent conditions. Um, that's kind of been a large focus of us. And that's been something that's been very important to the team um, ever since the beginning is to really get those lived experiences, hear from the people who are experiencing it directly. Um, those sort of individuals can provide a little bit more insights uh, than maybe 
we might have internally. Um, an example of that just comes from me uh, having been diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Um, I sort of experienced maybe that hesitancy to, dis to disclose, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And I can bring maybe a little bit more unique of a perspective to that. Um, however, with that being said, you know, neurodiversity is not like a monolith. Everyone is different. Um, someone who has autism spectrum disorder might be some different than someone who has um, OCD. And we really want to hear from all of those groups. And that's meant partnering with everybody far and wide, hearing from everybody, letting people see our research and get input uh, so we can really champion that nothing about us without us uh, sort of philosophy. Because I can say from experience, that's the most frustrating thing when somebody is telling you what's best for you without including you in the conversation um, there to begin with. So we've been really working with those external partners to get those voices um, heard. And then also taking our finding and spreading it out to far and wide, anybody and everybody who will listen so that they can take <laughs> our insights um, and really implement that uh, globally to start helping out sort of neurodivergent candidates, making everybody have the best experience possible. That's awesome. And I mean, I think it's important to point out, like, we've been at this for four years, we do not claim to have all the answers. But what we're trying to do is make little little changes um, along the way to improve the assessment experience and share that information with others more broadly. Um, so really appreciate all of those um, insights that you've shared with us, Luke. All right, I think it's time for our last polling question. Um, so let's see if we can pop that up on the screen. The last question we have is specifically about neurodiversity. So tell us what percentage of the global population you think are neurodivergent? So your choices are 10 to 15%, 15 to 20%, 20 to 25, and 25 to 30%. I'll give you just a couple more seconds to think about it and submit your answer. It looks like everyone's voted. Let's see what you think. Twenty to twenty-five percent was the most popular response, so it's close. Um, but it's actually estimated at fifteen to twenty percent of the global population. Um, so with such a large percentage of um, representation in the global uh, community, organizations can bet that neurodivergent candidates are applying for your jobs. Um, and all of us can bet that some of our colleagues are neurodivergent and you may or may not even know that. Um, so Claire will talk a little bit more about the disclosure process here in a minute. Um, but this is really an important consideration for all of us to ensuring that we're doing whatever we can to support disability and neuro inclusion in organizations. So Luke, why don't you tell us about some of the key findings from the white paper that we published late last year? Yeah, um, so the first kind of key finding that I wanted to go through was actually that cognitive ability assessments seem to be um, a place where neurodivergent individuals can perform um, to an equal level. And this is actually really exciting for me uh, because I think it highlights that fact that different does not mean worse. Um, some people, uh, and the industry might have guessed um, that neurodivergent individuals would perform worse on cognitive ability assessments just due to the nature of the fact that uh, neurodivergent conditions are defined by uh, cognitive functioning differences. However, our research has found that not only when it comes to performance data, but also time spent and reactions, uh, cognitive ability assessments seem to be um, favoring neurodivergent individuals. So they can perform equally um, and feel like they have an equal opportunity uh, to perform there. So that's something that's really exciting. Um, our second key finding is related to uh, personality and behavioral assessments. We've actually found um, some evidence that supports previous research that shows that neurodivergent individuals have what we would call a spiky profile, uh, meaning that there might be sort of exaggerated places of strengths and exaggerated places of weaknesses, meaning there might be really high highs for things uh, that individuals are good at, and there might be some low lows uh, for things that they might struggle with. Um, I think an important sort of thing to point out here is that there is strengths and weaknesses. In the past, there's been a large focus on just the weakness 
aspect of it and looking at what neurodivergent individuals might not be good at. But we have found that there are strengths that would be very helpful to organizations um, and would be key skills that uh, organizations would want to leverage. However, with that being said, we also don't want to typecast neurodivergent individuals. And we don't want to say, you know, people with autism are good at X or people with OCD are good at Y and, for, and force them into the positions where they're doing those things purely based on um, a neurodivergent condition. Um, but with that being said, this sort of highlights the fact that recruiters need to be very mindful uh, when you're deciding what skills and abilities you want to test on. Because if they have that spiky profile, you don't want to be testing on something that might be a weakness for neurodivergent individuals, but in actuality is not important for the job because they might be disproportionately disadvantaged for something that won't actually affect their work there. Um, but I'm going to pass it off to Claire for our other key findings. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that struck us in the research was that exactly what you said. So we do tend to see differences across the different neurodivergent um, conditions. Um, so one thing that's important for us is rather than just looking at neurodivergent people as a whole, it's about, you know, understanding that actually there might be some groups within that who perform really well in an area, some groups who find that more challenging. And if you look at it all together, it kind of evens out and you might miss things. So we've really honed our disclosure form to help us get those insights into each of the different groups. But at the same time, we've seen that um, there is a lot of variation even within conditions. So we did a, a really kind of qualitative study on individuals with autism and found that actually what some people really liked about a process, other people found really hard. Uh, an example being the timer. Some people love being able to see how much the time they've got left, how far they are into a, an assessment, whereas other people just find that really anxiety inducing and can't focus on actually performing on the test because that timer is just there. Um, so for us, it was about understanding that it really needs to be a kind of individual led process. You need to speak to that person, not make assumptions based on these kind of typical strengths and challenges and understand what it is for them, what works for them, what might they need accommodations with to help them to perform as well as they can in that process um and you know often giving them the chance to try those tests in advance to see how it works for them um so yeah that was that kind of key finding and then the next one was around the hesitancy to disclose and i know we've talked about that a few times already um what we found was that you know we gave uh, individual with autism the chance to take four of our assessments um and to say would they disclose their condition in order to take that assessment? And actually what we found was that in, in, on the, for most assessments, they wouldn't want to disclose it. Uh, and that's not surprising given what we've heard before about the levels of bias that they are likely to see. Um, and likewise on our practice tests, we see really low levels of disclosure and that's in a low stake setting where they're not applying for jobs. The results aren't gonna be used in that way. Um, so I think there's, there's two things to bear in mind from this. One is the importance of universal design. So if we can make an assessment so that people don't have to disclose and we give them options, so do they want to see the timer or don't they want to see the timer, they can make those changes themselves rather than having to um, go to the recruiter and disclose in order to get that. The other piece is around kind of being really inclusive, um, using your wording carefully, being positive, um, we saw just by making small tweaks to a disclosure form, giving a nice introduction to neurodiversity, what it is, how we want to support people uh, with whatever accommodations they need, we were able to double our disclosure rates. And that's just from doing some small inclusive wording changes. Um, and I think the final thing is around not just understanding that actually for many people with neurodiversity, uh, divergent conditions, they don't consider it to be a disability. Um, our previous form used to say, do you consider yourself to have a disability? Yes, move on, ask us, answer mm -hmm. next question, tell us what condition. If no, you know, don't feel like you have to take this question. But we would have been missing a lot of people if we took it that way. So I think it's about separating it out. In our new disclosure form, we ask people, do you consider yourself to have any of these neurodivergent conditions? Do you consider that to be a disability? So when our new white paper comes out later this year, we'll be able to share some of those insights um, but just be really careful about your wording on that one. Uh, conscious of the time, so the final one I want to touch on is just how small changes can make a really big difference. We asked for feedback directly from the neurodivergent um, individuals and were able to apply some of that. So for us, it's all about applying these learnings into our products, into our platforms to make 
as inclusive an experience as possible. So we're working on the timer at the moment, giving people the option to hide it or to show it. Um, we are listening to feedback about people not wanting to always have their videos on in interviews, for example. Um, and it's amazing that even though it might not take a lot of effort to implement these changes, they can make such a big difference to the candidate experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such great examples. I mean, the power of language, if we were able to double disclosure rates just by small tweaks in the language um, that's used and the importance of creating that type of environment where candidates and participants would feel comfortable sharing that information. Such a simple change um, that has a, a huge amount of impact. Um, so Claire, thanks. And Luke, thank you for sharing those takeaways. Um, tell us about what's the, what is the team up to next? What's on our research agenda? Yeah, so next, we're actually in the process of finalizing our 2024 agenda, um, but we've already started last in the next coming year and four years, I guess, uh, as the program continues to move forwards. Um, with that being, we want to look at uh, additional conditions, um, right? So we want to make sure, like we said, all neurodivergent conditions are different. And we want to start looking more closely at each one, talking with more people, understanding more people's um, experiences. We also want to look at a wider range of test types. Um, there are so many different ways that tests are administered between simulations, gamified, static, computer adaptive, it goes, the list goes on and on. And we really want to look at those test types and how that affects neurodivergent individuals' um, experiences. Uh, we also want to continue to collect more reactions, hear directly from candidates of what their experience has been on our assessments. Um, and we also want to explore new options for accommodations requests. One of the things that we've heard um, time and time again from our clients and partners has been, it's a challenge to talk, to get recruiters and to get managers to talk about uh, this sort of process with candidates. So we want to find ways in which we can make that burden of disclosing and that sort of requesting of accommodation process even easier um, for people who have a neurodivergent condition. And then additionally, I feel like a broken record here, but we want to tell everybody about the research that we found. Uh, we've been submitting our research findings to every single paper, going to professional conferences, really just screaming from the mountaintops uh, the amazing work we've done and the things we found um, as a way to really get that out there so that others can use uh, the research findings that we've had. So whether or not you're a client of SHL, you can kind of take our findings um, and really make the neurodivergent individuals in your organization feel more at home, feel more included, um, feel like they're a part of the process. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point. And I mean, one of the goals of sharing that information is just to raise awareness. Like this is an important yeah. topic that we have not been paying enough attention to. So we are scratching the surface on this research. Um, we want to share that and we just want to bring awareness to the importance of that. Um, speaking of taking action, um, I'm conscious of time and I want to make sure that we've got enough time to cover one of the most important topics that we've got planned today about around what can you do to be more inclusive? Um, so Luke, you've shared some some examples of ideas, but I'm going to put you on the spot again. Tell us about some actionable ideas for those who are listening today. No matter who you are, what are some things that you can do to contribute to a more inclusive environment? Yeah, there's really no shortage of things that organizations, individuals, assessment providers can do to start making a difference right now. I mean, if we're just coming at this to begin with from the perspective of an organization who's trying to make their assessment process more inclusive for neurodivergent individuals, like Claire said, the first thing we recommend is start with the inclusive language. If you can position yourself as an ally and tell and make clear to neurodivergent individuals that you just want to help them, you're trying to help them be more successful, you might be able to reduce that burden to disclose and maybe even make it less of a burden because they feel more comfortable uh, to disclose in the first place. The second thing we recommend is to take an individualized approach, kind of, again, as Claire said, something that we've seen out in the, I guess, world, in the world of organizations, is there's sort of a tendency to jump to a one-size-fits-all. Somebody requested an accommodation, give them extra time, give them an alternative testing location. You just have that sort of one accommodation that's in your pocket, and you pull it out whenever somebody asks uh, that they need an accommodation. However, we would recommend taking more individualized approach, actually talk to the candidate, sit down with them, find out what might be barriers that they face so that you can come to a little bit better of a conclusion of what the best way to assist them is. You're not really servicing anybody if you're just giving an out of the box sort of accommodation uh, request to this population. 
And then the third sort of recommendation we have for organizations is to provide the opportunity to, to practice. This is sort of like two-sided. One, it'll help everyone, not just neurodivergent individuals, but it'll help everyone be more successful on your assessments, but also give neurodivergent individuals the opportunity to be sort of self-advocates. When you get the chance to practice, you get to see the assessment, you get to see what's going to be given to you. You can see maybe the barriers that you're going to have, and that allows them the opportunity to come back to you and say, hey, I noticed there's a lot of text on this screen. I struggle with that, uh, maybe because I have dyslexia. Are there screen reader options? Um, so by allowing practice, you give them the opportunity to be sort of self-advocates. Coming at it from the perspective of an assessment provider, um, we recommend just getting out there and start partnering to collect as much data as possible. As we've kind of said over and over again in the session, um, there's just not enough known right now. So the first thing you should do is get out there, start collecting data, start working with neurodivergent individuals to find out uh, what the sort of pain points of your assessments are. The next thing we recommend is sort of leveraging existing research to make small changes. As we said, small changes can have a big impact and there's a lot of small things that you can do to make your assessments better right now. One thing that we found is there aren't a ton of assessments that need to be completely overhauled in order to make them more um, equitable for everybody. You can do some small things like hiding the timer, um, working with uh, changing the wording of things, all sorts of small changes that can be easy wins and will help neurodiverse individuals be uh, more successful on your assessments. That's something that we found. We feed our research right back into our product design, uh, which is huge. And then the final thing for assessment providers is really try to apply a universal design. If we try to make assessments, from the beginning that have neurodivergent individuals in mind, then we can remove that burden to disclose and we're not putting uh, that sort of extra burden on individuals to tell us about their condition. We've thought about them from the very beginning, so there won't be a need uh, for them to disclose. Then if we're talking about researchers who wanna get involved, um, the first thing that they can do is start focusing on bridging that gap between science and practice. A lot of the research that's been done on neurodivergent individuals in the past, it's focused on academic environment. It's not really practical, um, organizational focused research. So researchers can kind of focus on switching that lens to make it more practice driven. Um, and then also include researchers with lived experiences on your research teams. That'll help get those diverse perspectives and really champion uh, that nothing about us without us sort of philosophy. Like I said, that's so important. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than having people who don't understand your experience telling you about what it is that you need to do in order to be successful. I think those are all great tips, especially the one about involving the neurodivergent community. I mean, in your content development, helping to remove those neurotypical biases that might be part of your assessment um, and developing your research questions, interpreting the findings. It's so important to have the involvement of the neurodivergent community from beginning to end. Yeah. And Charlene, what is your perspective on what um, our listeners can do in organizations to be more neuroinclusive or more disability inclusive? Um, I think, you know, one absolutely um include the disability community in 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 everything that you're doing in terms of your uh, ongoing developments and and you know don't assume that you know what their uh, needs are absolutely ask and and take that personalized uh approach i think for me it's it's about um in order to create this inclusive culture within a bit within your organization leading from the front storytelling, demonstrating that you are, you know, you've got uh, fantastic disabled talent within the business and, and that they're thriving. And, and especially if you've got leadership who have a disability or a neurodivergent condition, that they share that uh, so that, again, that can inspire our others to be able to disclose um, and, and, and maybe get the, the, the support that they need to be able to thrive within, within that workplace. Um, it's it's absolutely important that organizations recognize that this organically just will not happen by itself. You really do need to put resource behind it um, and it needs to be driven and, um, and people within the organizations need to be accountable for being disability inclusive and accessible along the way um, from product development and design to hiring and, 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 and delivery. So it's, it's really important that 
across the business that this is recognized as a value contribution to the business rather than about being um, um, something that just needs to be done um, from a compliancy point of view. So from, from that perspective, uh, I do believe that businesses uh, need to see the, the opportunity um, that inclusion and disability inclusion brings. Yeah, absolutely. That commitment is so important. And I think, you know, we all play a part in breaking down barriers to employment for the disabled community and the neurodivergent community. We all play a part in contributing to more inclusive work environments. And so one of the things I love about having conversations like this one is just the opportunity to raise awareness um, and to challenge everyone who's listening to us. What is one thing that you can walk away with um, that you can put into practice and you can do to make a difference? If we all take away one action from a conversation like this, collectively, we have an opportunity to make a big impact. So we're going to ask you, if you're listening to us today, think about one action that you will take away today to make a difference um, for inclusion, for disability inclusion, for neuro inclusion. So share with us in the word cloud, what's your one example of an action that you're going to take? Um, and we'll, we'll challenge you to think about that and put that into practice. While we're doing that, um, while our listeners are thinking about their action and making that commitment, Claire, tell us about where um, our listeners can go to learn more about um, our research program, um, some of the resources that we've got on SHL's website, some of the things that you've been working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, very excited to share these. Um, so there is our Purple Tuesday collection, which if you go to shl.com and our resources, you can see that. Um, you can also see our neurodiversity research collection. So that has things like blogs, podcasts, webinars, white papers, a link to our research page for those who are interested in getting involved. Um, a really nice way of having everything in one place that people can come to when they want our insights. Um, and this year we've recently launched our candidate facing information page on neurodiversity, which is part of our practice test site. So on shl.com forward slash shl direct, that's our practice test site. And we've got this information hub, which is designed to help our candidates to just become more comfortable with the testing process. If they are neurodivergent, they can get a bit of a feel for what it, um, what neurodiversity is, some top tips for navigating the process, some hints on what kind of accommodations might be helpful and how to go about requesting them, as well as the opportunity to get involved in our research with us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we've got some great suggestions coming in here on actions um, to take coming out of this conversation. I'm glad that we see use inclusive language, be more mindful of language. I think that's one of the key takeaways here is that language is so powerful um, and being intentional and deliberate about the language that you use and the impact that that can have. Um, listening, learning, understanding, open dialogue. I think these are all really great examples of ways that you can foster inclusion in your own organizations. Um, I am mindful that we are getting close to the end of our time here. Charlene, are there any other resources that you would point our listeners to if they want to learn more? Um, look, there is a wealth of information online. Um, I would say, depending on the type of neurodivergent condition, look at the, the different organizations that support those communities um, because they will have a wealth of information. Uh, so, for example, the National Autistic Society or the Society for Neurodiversity, mm -hmm. they have got uh, some really great uh, things uh, there. Um, our YouTube channel, go go to it. There's there's some lovely um, learning uh, resources there, and and of course, um, you know, reaching out to expert organisations um, to have them to come in and to explore with you directly where um, where there is opportunities to improve is is also uh, really important. Awesome. I think we're going to take time for one question. Um, we've got one minute left, so Claire. Do you want to tackle this one? How can neurodiversity be embraced to harness and leverage productivity at work? Yeah, I saw this one in our pre-post um, and it really spoke to me because I'd recently read a paper about ADHD and thriving at work. Um, and the researchers had found that by creating a psychologically safe environment, so that's an environment where someone feels safe to share information and take into personal risks, they are more likely to proactively disclose. So to share that information up front rather than wait for an issue to come up. But which means that their resort, their manager can help support them, give them the accommodations to make that working environment work for them, which then leads to thriving at work. So your performance, your potential to learn, 
uh, satisfaction, willingness to stay. So it is that psychologically safe, encouraging that proactive disclosure uh, and being ready to make those changes as you go. Thanks, Claire. All right. Well, we have blown through an hour here already. Um, so much more to talk about, though. If you've got additional questions, if you want to reach out to learn more, um, check out our website. We do have our neurodiversity collection on SHL's website. We also have a purple collection, which are um, a number of resources related to our partnership with purple that you can check out there. We are just getting started with this research. As I mentioned, this is an ongoing commitment um, from SHL to increase the inclusive nature of our assessments and improve the assessment experience for candidates with disabilities. So stay tuned. Um, we've got a lot more coming with neurodiversity. We're also expanding to look at research around visual and hearing impairments. So lots of exciting things happen. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, please do reach out if you've got any questions. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.